We're already on season three? Okay, let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Exam Secrets, Season 3, Episode 1, Pediatrics. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at exam questions in one clinical course. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at pediatrics. So if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment, grab your piece of paper, and let's go. So today we're going to be looking at pediatrics. So we'll start with our question one. Remember the gist of these videos is you may pause the video before I give you the answer to give you time to write down your answer so that you can compare your answer to my answer and see if we are thinking the, in the same line or we are differing. Uh, and then you can comment and we can carry the discussion from there on. So question one, Malita is a 22 year old lady who has delivered a baby via cesarean section. Unfortunately, the baby dies soon after birth. Give three main primary reasons why neonates die. Give three indications for cesarean delivery. Explain how you will go about informing Malita about the death of her baby. You may pause the video right now before I give you the answer. And here comes the answer. So the three most common thing, reasons why neonates actually die even here in Zambia. The first is of course prematurity and low birth weight. Remember that this is going to be associated with multiple um, other comorbidities or multiple other complications of prematurity to be um, exact. Then the second reason is that they could be due to infections. The third reason it could be due to some intrapartum events which could be malformations, deformations, and chromosomal anomalies. Give three indications for cesarean delivery. So labor dystocia, abnormal or indeterminate, fetal heart rate. This was formerly referred to as a non-reassuring fetal heart rate. So if there is in fetal distress, a malpresentations, multiple gestations, and even suspected fetal macrosomia. You can just pick three out of these. And explain how you'll go about informing Malita about the death of her baby. So this has to be done in a very systematic manner. So the first thing that I will do is, of course, sit the mother down in a quiet and a private room. Now this, after I do this, I should make sure that she is comfortable. And if she's okay with the family members that are in the room, I can keep them there. If she's not, I can allow them to leave. And of course, if her husband is there and she's okay with it, the husband may stay. I will introduce myself. And of course, any other stuff that is present, I will establish who is in the room. So ask who the mother is, ask who the father is, their names, because you don't want to break bad news to someone who's or a wrong patient. So you want to first gain uh, their uh, who they are. Then of course, I will foreshadow that I have bad news for this individual. So a statement like I am, I'm afraid I have some bad news or I'm afraid I have very bad news for you guys. Um, and then after this point, I'll, I'll proceed to tell the woman that the child has demised. So I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. Um, your baby has died. And of course, this is going to be in an empathic way. And of course, with comforting body language. And of course, this should be followed by a quiet, I'm sorry for your loss. And then after of which I will provide any information concerning the death of the child. If I do have that information available with me, then I'll ask if they have any questions and if they wish to see the child. Then of course, I'll leave the room and give them space so that they can begin the griefing process. Then moving on to question two, 
Tom is a four-year-old who presents to the ER at 10 a.m. He has a fever of 39.9 degrees Celsius and is said to have fitted 20 minutes ago at home, though Tom is awake. Give at least four features of a febrile convulsion. What would be three contraindications for performing a lumbar puncture in this case? What three body areas or sites would you examine thoroughly in order to identify the cause of the fever? You may pause the video right now to screen the answer at your screen and of course look like as if um, you are insane. <laughs> Anyways, you're not insane, you're studying for the exam. Here comes the answer. So remember that a febrile convulsion, number one, there should be an absence of CNS infection like a meningitis in a neurologically normal patient. The second thing is that the age should be between six months to six years. The third thing is that the temperature should be greater than 38 degrees. You may have a simple febrile seizure where these are occurring 24 hours, uh, within 24 hours of the fever, and they're going to be lasting less than 15 minutes. These tend to be generalized tonic-clonic, or they could be complex or atypical febrile convulsions, which are pretty much lasting longer than 15 minutes, and they recur within 24 hours. These tend to be focal. So this child may have a focal type or any typical type of febrile convulsion. Then what are the three contraindications for performing a lumbar puncture? So in this case, the things like cardio, cardio pulmonary instability, things like increase in intracranial pressure, which could be manifested by a cushion's triad or papilloedema, may be features of um, increased intracranial pressure and may contraindicate you from actually doing a lumbar puncture. You may have seizures, for example, in status epilepticus, uh, recurrent seizures. You may also have infections of the skin area where you're supposed to perform the lumbar puncture. Then the three body areas or the sites that you're going to examine thoroughly include number one, the respiratory system. So obviously you want to look at the upper respiratory system, pretty much the nasopharyngeal area and the lower respiratory system, pretty much the chest. You also want to look at the ear. So in case of an otitis media, an acute otitis media, it may cause fever. You also want to look at the urinary tract uh, system so you want to examine the urine so the genitalia then moving on to question three sakai is a 12 year adolescent who has been living with hiv infection since she was a baby both her parents are deceased and she lives with her uncle who is a busy manager in a big multinational company she has been on antiretroviral therapy for 11 months now or oh, 11 years now so she's been on this almost her whole life she walks into the art clinic for a routine six monthly visit she looks very well nourished and at ease with no obvious clinical suggestion of ill health she is on tdf uh, that's tenofova disoproxil uh, 3tc that's lamovidine and uh, evf which is efavirenz her last viral load is 34,207 copies of per mil. That's very high. Give one common side effect for each of the three drugs mentioned above. What advice are you going to give Sakai during this visit? Give three WHO stage two conditions. In the next visit, you establish that Sakai has treatment failure. What is the second line regimen Sakai needs to be changed to? So you may pause the video at this moment. I know this is probably one of the, the most challenging pediatrics um, video depiction that I've actually put out ever on the channel. So here comes the answer. So Tenofovar, uh, pretty much one of the side effects is renal failure. So that's why we, we want to avoid certain preparations. So there's TDF and there's TAF. If someone has renal failure, we avoid TDF. We rather give them TAF. That's tender for alaflonamide. Then uh, lamovidine causes myelosuppression, so bone marrow suppression, but not as severe as AZT. If Ivarens causes a disruption in the sleep cycle, so they may have insomnia, they may have uh, dysphoric dreams, they may have nightmares. Then advice that you would give her is, of course, you would encourage compliance that she takes the drugs as they are supposed to be taken. 
then give three WHO stage two conditions. So you may have recurrent upper respiratory tract infections, sinusitis, tonsillitis, otitis media, pharyngitis. You may have pruritic papular eruptions. You may have seborrheic dermatitis. You may have fungal nail infections. You may have recurrent ulcers. You may even have some skin manifestations like molascum contagiosum. And then the next visit, you establish that she has treatment failure. Of course, you already know that she has treatment failure. If this, if this uh, female has been on treatment for 11 years, you'd expect her viral load to be suppressed, at least even less than 400. But it's not less than 400, it's 34,207 copies. It means that she has what is referred to as virological failure. So you want to change her to AZT, 3TC or FTC, plus boosted lopinavir. That's lopinavir and ritonavir. Now question four. Louisa, six years old girl, school girl, complains of pain in all four limbs. She weighs 14 kilograms. On examination, she is febrile with a protuberant forehead, but none tender. Her, jaw, her jaws are prominent. The following is her lab results. WBC 14,400, HB 6.3, hematocrit 22%, MCV 80.6, platelet 280,000 um, per cubic millimeter, RDW red cell distribution width 22.6. List two differential diagnoses. Which one is your most likely diagnosis? State her nutritional status as per Wellcome Trust classification. Write down four investigations towards your diagnosis. So you may pause the video right now to actually have a look at uh, this. So here comes the answer. So this is a, a, a patient that has come in with pain in the, all the four limbs and she has the protuberant forehead. So obviously she has frontal bossing. She also has macrognathia, which is uh, prominent jaws. And she has a high white blood cell count, low HB, a low hematocrit, the MCV is normal, the platelet is normal, the RDW is greatly increased. So most likely this child may have sickle cell. So she has a vasoclusive uh, crisis in a sickle cell patient. It may be tempting to say uh, acute dactylitis, but remember that dactylitis is very uncommon beyond the age of five. Some sources actually say that you may have it between six months to six years, but uh, Medscape actually says after five years, it's very rare to actually have this. Then this may also be osteomyelitis, and there was a suggestion of having malaria thrown into the mix. So tell me what you think if malaria could be added to this. That's why I'm putting query malaria. And of course, the most likely diagnosis is a vasoclusive crisis in a sickle cell patient. So part C, state her nutritional status as per welcome classification. So remember that here the expected weight of the child can be cal calculated in many ways. So suppose if this child is less than one year, imagine this is just extra information that I'm giving you. If they're less than one year, you'd say nine months plus the, um, or nine plus the, um, what do you call this? The age in months divided by two. So if this child is weighing two months, You'd say 2 plus 9, that gives you um, 11. Then 11 divided by 2, that would give you somewhere around 5.5. So the salt should be 5.5 kg. Now, if they are between 1 year to 5 years, you'd say the age in years plus 5. Then you multiply that answer by 2. So if there were 2 years, you'd say 2 plus 5, that gives you 7. 7 times 2, that gives you 14 kg. Then if someone is between 5 years to 14 years, you'd say the weight is equals to the, the 4 multiplied by the age in years. So 4 multiplied by 6 would give you around 24 kilograms. So this child should be 24 kilograms. So what's her expected percentage of weight? So we say for her actual weight divided by the expected weight, multiply that by 100. So 14 kilograms divided by 24 multiplied by 100 gives you 58.3 percent so remember this is less than 60 percent of the expected body weight so this child has marasmus because she doesn't have any edema then write down four investigations towards your diagnosis so you want to do your hb electrophoresis remember this is the gold standard for diagnosis of sickle cell you want to do a peripheral smear you want to do blood cultures you also want to do an rdt for malaria because we had that as one of the differentials 
Then the last and indeed final question, Chongo is a 15 year old who was recently diagnosed with a cardiac condition. His doctors told him that his, value, his valves, not values, valves are damaged. He has been on anti-failure treatment for one year now. Two weeks ago, he presented to the hospital with history of fever and tiredness. He has lost a lot of weight. He has finger clubbing and his temperature is 39 degrees Celsius. His urinalysis is positive for blood. What is your full, what is your most likely full diagnosis? Name four criteria that are key in the diagnosis of this condition associated with fever and hematuria. Apart from this particular complication that has occurred in this cardiac patient, give two other complications that may ensure. Give two drugs that you need to give and for how long. You may pause the video. This is indeed the last question. Make sure at least you get it right. And here comes the answer. So this child has been sick for quite some time. They have some problems with the uh, heart valves and of, of course that will give you a, a murmur if they have a problem with the heart valves and they have a fever. Remember that a fever plus a murmur is going to be equal to infective endocarditis. Now because this person has had this for quite some time, it's most likely that they have a subacute type of infective endocarditis and the, the blood itself could be due to a glomerulonephritis that is secondary to a subacute infective endocarditis but definitely this child has a subacute infective endocarditis the name for criteria that are key in the diagnosis of the condition associated with fever and hematuria remember that this is the duke's criteria you want to have positive blood cultures positive echocardiographic findings those two are referred to as major then you have uh, embolic phenomenon, you have immunological phenomenon, and you have microbiological evidence. Then apart from this particular complication, the other two complications are going to be things like cerebrovascular accidents. You may also have disseminated intravascular coagulation. Give two drugs that you need to give and for how long. So these drugs initially are supposed to be given IV for at least two weeks. Then you can give crystalline penicillins for four to six weeks, gentamicin for two weeks. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Pediatrics uh, MK's Exam Secrets. If you did, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment, share your thoughts on some of the questions that you do agree with and some that you don't agree with. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.